Hello plant lovers, it is Matthew in Melbourne welcoming you back to my channel. Thank you very much for finding me. YouTube is a very crowded and busy world so thank you for that and thank you for subscribing. If you do, I post every Friday about my continuing amateur adventures growing cold, cool, intermediate orchids either inside or outside or really not at all. So plant lovers, if that sounds like your bag, do hit subscribe. My Friday ramblings are that of a complete amateur, but they're the things that I've discovered that work for me here. So they might not work for you. It's not the only way or the best way or the right way perhaps, but things that I've figured out work for me. So if your climate is similar, it might help you as well. Which brings us cunningly to the story of today's video, which is all about this pendulous beauty. Look at that flower spikes and flowers everywhere and it is a gongora and it is gongora galeata. Now I am extremely happy that this is a alive and be blooming because plant lovers truth be told I killed the first gongora that I bought it was a seedling a real seedling it had one tiny pseudobulb and yeah I just didn't get it right and it shriveled and died now I might know why. So we'll go into all that. We'll go into the basic care of Gongora and where I've got mine growing. So you might have a better understanding of how to grow them if your conditions are similar to mine. And like me, you may have failed in the past. So firstly, let's talk about this one, Gongora galeata. So the Gongora genus is a New World orchid. So they're all generally from the tropical Americas. And this particular one is from Southern Mexico. Interestingly, it is a highish altitude plant that grows in semi-deciduous forests, which are quite moist. And one of the principal trees in that forest is the liquid amber. Now, the liquid amber, as you all perhaps might know, is an amazing foliage tree. It goes incredible scarlet colours in autumn and grows incredibly well here in Melbourne. So there you go. If only I had a liquid amber tree, I could try and grow my gongora in it. But the point of that is, though, high altitude, cloud covered forests. It's all about humidity and a bright indirect light. So cloud cover is a bit like having shade cloth. So you are kind of sometimes in direct light, but the cloud cover maintains a continual sort of mist that filters the light. These, however, are growing as an epiphyte in the tree itself. And as liquid ambers are deciduous, my hazardy guess would be that this type of orchid perhaps gets a little bit more sunlight or direct light or brighter light in winter than it does summer. Now, the gongoras are related to Stanhopia, and you can see that the pseudobulbs, well, the whole growth pattern is very similar. So we have these pseudobulbs growing close to the soil and a couple of leaves sprouting out the top. One of the differences is though that the flower spikes don't sort of penetrate from below the pseudobulb, they are actually coming out from just at the base of the bulb and arc over and down. So you don't need necessarily a basket for these, they can grow in a pot, you're not going to stymie your flowers, but we'll get to that in a minute. The Gongora genus was named after a Spaniard who was the governor of Peru for a while and he was Don Antonio Caballero y Gongora. And he was Viceroy of New Granada, which is now Colombia and Ecuador. That was all in the late 18th century, and this genus was named after him, Gongora. And Galeata is interesting, because that is Latin for helmet. And in, weirdly, when I was Googling translation, Galeata in Romanian, which is very Latin based, actually means bucket. So you guess, you know, you tip a helmet upside down, it becomes a bucket in Romanian. However, I am not completely sure quite what the helmet attribute is to this, but nonetheless, that's what Galeata means. All right, so we've alluded to the foresty homeland of this orchid, which gives you an indication of how you might need to grow it. So one of the things about high altitude environments generally, not always, but generally, is lots of cloud cover, i.e. humidity. So not the same humidity perhaps as you'd get in a lowland tropical forest, which is evaporation and humidity, but this is cloud cover, so lots of moisture in the air, which again also acts as a bit of an umbrella to the sunlight. So one of the key things to these plants, and I did manage to find one image of it growing, and it was on the branch of a liquid amber tree, and it looked very verdant, very green, very mossy, relatively lowish light, but that's the thing kind of a constantly moist environment. Asterix. 
So it is a plant that doesn't want to dry out. And during its growing season, which is basically spring, summer, early autumn, it doesn't ever really want to dry out. But in the late autumn, winter period, it is a little drier. So it will want to dry out a little bit, but not completely. So essentially, just ease up on your watering, but not a plant to allow to dry out. And I think, plant lovers, well, I know, that was the issue with my seedlings. So seedlings often need slightly more pronounced versions of the adult plant's care, particularly in cultivation. So if you have a seedling Goncora, I would be growing it in a very moisture retaining medium and I'd be keeping it sort of warmish and humid for the first couple of years until it really oomphs up. Mine didn't because I was keeping it a little too much on the dry side and in too much bright light, I think. Anyway, I've learned my lesson. So that's the light thing, light humidity. Now, so saying, I'm in Melbourne. Weirdly, a lot of orchids that grow in similar uh, sort of high-ish altitude montane environments do quite well for me here. So the Sologenes, for example, from the Himalaya, um, Cymbidiums in that Southern Chinese region, which is very mountainous and relatively cool. So high altitudes, but cooler slash cold winter nighttime minimums humid but not tropical humid so that is an environment i can try and replicate quite successfully in melbourne and that also includes high altitude but cooler growing orchids from the americas because a lot of peruvian high altitude orchids do extremely well for me here as well so if you are in a temperate slash moist mediterranean climate like melbourne our winter minimums in the inner city where i am don't freeze they can get down to two to three four degrees, five centigrade. So that is the high 30s, low 40s Fahrenheit. Close-ish, but not that close to freezing. The further out you get from central Melbourne, the cooler the winter nighttime minimums can be. And you can certainly get sub-zero and frost in the outer part of the city, but not where I am. So that kind of weirdly replicates those mountain environments, just not with the cloud cover and that cloudy humidity. That you provide with a hose. So to maintain the humidity outside, I don't really do much. The area that I grow them is undercover. I'll link my grow space video here, but I'll also show you right now where I am growing it. So as you can see, the roof is covered with a translucent material, which allows through light, but obviously protects everything from rain. So open to the side, I get ambient airborne moisture. So when it's raining, the humidity in there is fine. But obviously in summer, it can get warm because it kind of acts like a greenhouse. And I have Mastavalia growing around there as well, and Sologenes. And all I do really is on very warm days, I water in the morning and I splosh water about. And if it's particularly warm and it's going to be warm throughout the night, I'll do the same again in the evening. Not that often because what you don't want is cold temperatures, moisture and still air because that can cause all manner of unpleasant fungal and bacteria growth to happen, which you don't really want. But if there's enough breeze and it's warm and the water's going to evaporate, it's a great way to create humidity. So again, I'm pretty laissez-faire about it. So don't get too hung up upon that whole humidity issue. If you're in an area with kind of moderate ambient humidity anyway, you'll be fine. And I grow this successfully <laughs> now in the same area that I'm growing Stanhopia, which this is part of a family of, and Sologenes. So they, for me, are taking very similar conditions. And my first ever Stanhopia has bloomed, which I made a video about, and my Sologenes do really well. And this is doing well too. There are, of course, warmer loving Sologenes and warmer loving Stanhopias and warmer loving Gongoras. So you know what I mean. <laughs> this particular one grows from a cooler climate and it grows well with a cooler climate Sologenes and Stanhopias. So potting wise, as you can see, plastic in a plastic hanger oh my goodness so aesthetically unpleasing to me i know roll your eyes go ahead <laughs> what i was intending to do was to pot this in a small wire basket you could also use a wooden basket but i was going to use a small wire one in a moisture retaining mixture so i would have lined it with a lot and lot a lot of sphagnum and medium-sized bark a lot of perlite and sphagnum mixed up with that. So quite free draining, but moisture retaining. However, I bought this in spring at an orchid sale. Again, another reason why you should join your local orchid groups or societies, or at least find them, because they have sales. And this one was from one such organization. And as you can see, it is a mature plant. So it was a division of a mature plant. Um, 
kind of easier, I think, perhaps to get going with than uh, the seedling that I clearly failed with. But now I understand my Gongora more. But before I really had a chance to repot it, it burst into bloom. So I am now going to leave it and perhaps in late winter spring I'll repot it um, before anything should happen. The other thing is it's also producing new growths at the moment. There's one there, there's another one in there. I can see quite a lot actually. Uh, so not, well, yeah, you don't really want to repot something while it's in bloom. Never a good idea. So with this one I'm going to wait until it's kind of in stasis, which is probably going to be in winter coming into spring, and then I will repot it in a basket which will just look a little more attractive. And in fact, why not? I'll make a video about it because um, it'll be something for us to live for, the repotting of my Gongora. One of the things that is written about this is the fragrance, the lovely fragrance of the flowers. Hmm. Lovely perhaps is not the word that springs to mind. Now it's not awful. It's not like a, a catty smell, although my dearest other half, the good doctor, thinks it does smell like cats, but it does smell like a really dialed up sweet spicy smell. Mm, not terribly unpleasant but I'm in a relatively small room and it's certainly smellable let's just say. So it is it is a fragrant orchid so bear that in mind if you're growing it indoors if your climate can't take it outdoors because it is going to perfume the air and I think it's a fragrance that might be an acquired taste. Now the other thing then is the flowers themselves. Now look, aren't they beautiful? And what I also love is that kind of corkscrew, the beautiful form of the flowers before they've opened. Very symmetrical. It looks like sort of 70s metalwork, doesn't it? <laughs> and then the flower, so the flower buds as you can see are curling up and I guess that might look like a helmet, maybe a Roman helmet possibly or a conquistador helmet, given that it was discovered in the New World and named by the Spaniards. But then when the flower opens, as you can see here, it's pointing up and it opens and looks very orchid-like. And in fact, that kind of cluster doesn't look dissimilar to some of the smaller pendulous cymbidium species types that you find. Anyway, so that's what it looks like. And this is just covered in spikes all the way around, which is absolutely wonderful. Colour-wise though, hmm, not the most thrilling. It's sort of like a mustardy colour with um, a little bit of gold to the to the centre there, but mustardy, khaki, yeah, not thrilling. But what is thrilling though is the sheer volume of them. So I have made a video about dull, small orchid flowers, bless them. I would class this in perhaps the dull flower spectrum, but the sheer volume of it makes it very sculptural and beautiful in my mind. So although the flower might not be colourful, um, the mass of them is just divine. So I'm really loving it. Food-wise, nothing outrageously different. In winter, of course, it's not dormant, but it's liking to be on the drier side. So you really, you're dialing down your water and eliminating any feed. And like many orchids, like Stanhopias and Slogenes, for example, when you start to see the growth happening is the time to really get into feeding. Now, weirdly, I'm filming this in February, which is towards the very end of summer here in Australia, and I have got new growths coming, which means I'm going to continue to be feeding this through into autumn and probably early winter because that's what the plant is telling me it wants. When those new growths have matured, I would then stop with the feed. And the feed I'm using is, during the growing period, a liquid-based solution. And that is either an orchid specific liquid feed or it's a general fertilizing liquid feed or it's more of a tonic which is seaweed based or worm juice all of which regardless i dial right down to sort of one six one eight one tenth of the recommended dose and give that quite liberally maybe every two or three waterings during the warmer growing periods and as ever in spring i do a little topical application of a slow release fertilizer and I always repot my orchids with some of that slow release fertilizer in the medium as well. And I always use one that releases over a six month period, not 12, because you don't want to be releasing fertilizer when an orchid is dormant or it's winter. So there we are, handsome plant, the growth habit, yes, very similar to kind of a smaller Stanhopia, and like Stanhopia is not gonna do well with direct sunlight, the leaves will get quite damaged. So bright indirect, imagine it is clinging to the fork of a tree in a beautiful misty forest in Mexico. Try and replicate that. <laughs> I think we'd all love that, heavens. Anyway, bright indirect light, possibly 
brighter in winter if you can manage it but i wouldn't worry too much about that uh, and that's what i'm giving it so the other point is that the flower spikes emerge from the very base of the pseudo bulb um which is a flowering habit like several other orchid types actually so yes not poking down but coming out which means that you can have it in a regular pot if you want as long as it was elevated so that the pendulous blooms aren't going to get caught up and then the new growths appear from the base of the old pseudobulb. So what I don't know, because I've only had this for six months, is whether the old pseudobulbs are capable of reblooming in the next season. And this is a plant that will flower from summer into autumn, which is the season now. We're in late summer heading into autumn, and I've still got many weeks, I think, of blooms coming from this. Relatively long lasting. The first spike has gone over, which you can perhaps see in there. So all of those flowers have withered and died but because you have so many spikes you're going to get at least a month of blooming out of this orchid because there are simply so many flowers to open over a period of time the other great thing is too they actually come off quite easily the finished flower so even on a spike when the flowers start to turn they're very easy to pinch out so um your plant's always going to look attractive and with the watering hanging them in such a device as this or in a basket or a, um, a wooden basket means that obviously they are going to free drain like there is no tomorrow so obviously your mix is free draining but as the plant is suspended it's going to dry uh, very quickly and because of the ambient air around it it will also dry and evaporate faster cause plastic evaporates slower if this was in terracotta it would evaporate faster and if it was in a basket that was very open that would evaporate faster as well. So all of these things, you kind of got to figure out what's your own microclimate and how you're potting something. But this, as it is right now, will retain more moisture than it would if it was in a wire or a wooden slat basket with lots of sphagnum moss. So bear that in mind. Depends how hot your ambient temperatures get. So there we are, plant lovers. Gongora galeata after Don Antonio Caballero y Gongora, who is now immortalized for Ever in this plant. I am so thrilled with it. It is doing really, really well. I'm slightly tempted now, like all of these things. Once you have a success, think, oh, maybe I need to get more Gongoras in my life. Well, watch this space. There are some which have sort of slightly more colourful flowers, so we'll have a look, we'll see. But otherwise, I'm really happy with how this one's going, and it's going to make me happier when it's in a basket with sphagnum moss. So watch this space. And to watch this space, you'll have to hit subscribe. I do post every week on a Friday. Very amateur ramblings. But if that is your bag, hit subscribe. Join me on my journey and we'll see what's going to happen next week. But until then, plant lovers, take care wherever you are. And I'll look forward to seeing you next Friday.